That's gettable, Vince Carter. I mean, well, it's tough. Let's talk about this. First of all, they're talking like this is these are two point shots they're they're taking. These are three point shots they're taking. Talk about it's gettable. And that's what's amazing about uh, you know Steph Curry as well as Klay Thompson because these guys have the ability to shoot the three point shot like they're shooting mid range two point shots. And in my opinion, fourteen is gettable. <laughs> 14 gettable for you, Zach? Why not? You're going to doubt Steph Curry? No, if I'm asking for you. Tanking, for you. He might have got, 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 got it last. Oh, for me? No, 14 is not gettable <laughs> for me. Maybe like eight. Maybe eight. <laughs> there we go. Well, let's put you out there. We'll find out. Welcome to The Jump. I am Rachel Nichols, indeed, with Vince Carter and the host of The Low Podcast. I can't do it. The Low Post Podcast, Zach Lowe. I was trying to get your pause in there, Zach, and it's just, you know, <laughs> not there. I'll just default to the future Hall of Famer. Guys, coming up, we are going to be talking about all kinds of stuff, including LaMarcus Aldridge retiring suddenly today, citing health concerns. We'll reflect on his career in just a minute. But first, and bear with us here, not all the equipment in the studio is working, but the show is going to go on. We are going to be talking about all sorts of things on this show. we got to start, though with Luca Magic. It's not exactly up there as a nickname, guys, with catchphrases like the Iceman, nicknames like the truth, shout out Paul, the answer, things like that. But, you know, when you, Luca played in Europe, fans called him Wonder Boy, which I don't know, he's definitely a grown man. I will give him that. I'm not sure that one works anymore either. So if you've owned a phone, you've seen the shot we're gonna be talking about in this show. Oh my though, it is worth watching again. Check the circumstances here. The Grizzlies were the ones ahead in this game, up five, with just more than a minute on the clock. By the time Luka took the inbound, with just 1.8 seconds left, Memphis was still up two, right? And that's when Luka did this. Got to get it in. Here's Luka. Gets it away. It's gone! A Doncic dagger! He wins it! As he was stumbling, he somehow got it to go. Yeah, from his foot, through insane traffic. Just ridiculous here. Luca's teammates, of course, went bonkers afterward. Jalen Brunson doing a water sneak attack. That's not nice. And the internet nearly broke. LeBron, Steph, Dame, even Des Bryant chimed in. Afterward in the locker room, the Mavs gave Luca not just the game ball, but also a wrestling style belt that the team awards for the best defensive player in every win. Now, Dorian Finney-Smith joked with Luca afterward that he didn't deserve it because he only had two steals. But gosh, Luca clearly thrilled for winning it for the first time in his Mavs career. He brought the belt to his post-game press conference. And honestly, can you blame the coaching staff for wanting to reward him just a little bit more? In truth, after that shot, they could have just went around the arena, given him everything that was not nailed down. Uh, look at Rick Carlisle. Here's what he had to say after the game. This is just a, you know, this is one of those joyous, joyous nights, you know, where where we, uh, you know, we we escaped, you know, we we had Houdini. I can't tell you how many thousand dollars I've lost to him on half court shots. Um, you know, one time in Mexico City, our Second year, you know, I I paid him off in pesos because I was so pissed about it. Um, and I don't bet I don't bet with him anymore. That is a smart move, Rick Carlisle. I, I mean, it's amazing, and I know what he's talking about, right? Just this past Monday night, we saw him doing that soccer style shot before the Mavericks game, where he flipped it with his feet and then took that impossible angle. I think we have the video. Just that impossible angle from the side in the arena. Woo! Luca does, he just doesn't do this in practice though. He saves a lot of these in the game. Since he entered the league, no one else in the NBA has hit more tying or go ahead three pointers in the clutch. This was against Portland. That was just insane, right? From his rookie year. You got the playoff shot in the bubble versus the Clippers. Oh, I'll take that, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> or from this season, we all remember that three against Boston 
just absolutely crazy. And every time Luca makes one of those shots, he's pretty modest about it. He called what he did last night, quote, lucky. He said he couldn't even see the basket when the ball left his hands. That I buy, by the way. Uh, he's clearly aware, though, of what a big deal they are. It imbues the entire team with confidence, helps paper over what, let's be honest, has been a bit of an up and down stretch for Dallas. In just this past week, there has been a round of intense scrutiny on the Luca Kristaps Porzingis relationship, fans going to the internet and to the tape, counting how many daps they had for each other during various games. There was also the bit of controversy over the play-in game. You had both Luka Doncic say he doesn't even understand why there is a play-in tournament. He doesn't think it's fair. And then Mark Cuban came in, doubled down, despite Despite that Mark was one of the owners who voted for it. That spurred some eye rolling around the league since the Mavs were only publicly upset with the new system after, um, how do I say this delicately, falling into the seventh seed themselves. Still, last night, as soon as that ball switched through the netting, it was just like a wave of the wand, which I guess means Luca Magic is the right nickname indeed. Thank you to our control room for getting us through that segment. That was very impressive. I want to transition, I mean, look, he was the MVP favorite going into the year. And that's, I always make the point, Vince, that's just the betting, right? That's who the people in Vegas think they can get the most money on. But that was a bit of the level set or the expectation. He's not an MVP candidate right now around the league. But has he lived up to your expectations for year three? I, I tell you what, Rachel, he's been smooth sailing, though. For, uh, we watched him as soon as he got into the league. And you're like, wow, this is not your everyday rookie. He's, he's playing a, at a different level and a different pace, which was his pace. And then he moves into his second year. You can tell he's gotten better. And he's gotten better in his third year. MVP, yeah, in the beginning. Because we were watching him in the bubble. And he was outstanding. And he's been outstanding up and down all year. But I tell you what, he's still, he's still playing at a, at a great level. Maybe not MVP level, but he's as as uh, advertised for sure. He's not going to win MVP unless something crazy happens, but he's quietly rising up the ladder. And as for meeting expectations, heck yes, he's meeting <laughs> expectations. What did people expect? He's averaging 29, 9, and 9 again. He's up to 36% from three, 40% since a really cold first 10 or so games. And there is nothing you can do with him when he gets into the paint. You can see the floater, he takes it, he makes half of them. You double him, he's thinking one step ahead, he gets into his bags of pivot moves and fakes, he kicks out to an open shooter. He is one of the best passers in the world already, if not the best passer in the world. I don't know what people expected, but yeah, he may not win MVP, but he's 21, 22 years old. For him to do what he's doing now is ridiculous, and he remains on track to be an all-time great player. I mean, when we level set, right, it's not just that he's met expectations. It's that he keeps raising expectations, right? He got drafted. Despite the fact that he was picked third, there were still a lot of people around the league who thought this guy should have been number one. We think he's going to be a force. By the end of his rookie year, of course, everyone knew it. And the prediction was, hey, sometime in the next five years, he'll win an MVP. Maybe sometime in the next five to ten years, he'll win a championship. By this season, the expectation that he's made blossom through the middle of the year has been, is he on par with Larry Bird? Is that going to be what we say at the end of his career, since that comparison has been made by two of Bird's ex-teammates? So I, I just think it is amazing when we talk about expectations for Luca. All he is doing is raising the bar as we go along. And that game winner last night, Vince, I cannot imagine what it feels like to have the ball leave your hands like that with that little time on the clock, you're the one on this panel. What can you tell us about what that moment is <laughs> well, like? Let me go back and say, first of all, he's almost averaging a triple-double, uh, uh, Luca. that is. But let me tell you, uh, uh, you know, in the era of float, flotation, shooting the floater and the flotation device, and you see, <laughs> you know, you see Luca shooting it, you see Trey shooting it. Uh, I, I mean, that's, it was an amazing shot. But I tell you, the feeling of hitting the game-winning shots, there? I think it's three parts. It's the confidence in that hey, I'm going to take this shot. And then it's midway in the air. You're like, uh, that might go in or this is going in or it's not going in. <laughs> and then the result. So we're going to talk about the result of making it. And I think that's when it goes in. That's when you see the result and, and everybody's excited about it. But I, I think there's three parts to the game because sometimes you, you can come up there and you're feeling confident. Um, let's talk about Reggie Jackson, who was in a rhythm. Reggie Jackson was in a rhythm. They got him the ball at the end of the game. He got to his spot. He knocked the shot down. And then there was a situation like Luca, who was in a, in a situation where he, I'm falling down. Let me just get it to the rim. And you'd never know what happens. But then there's situations, like I say, when a guy's in, in, his, in, his, in his bag and 
he can step into that shot and you it goes up it's like all right this is good then it halfway and you're like uh and then it goes in yes because i've been in the situation where it's like halfway when it left my hand it felt good halfway i'm like this is not going in and then the result was on the other end Ooh, i'm telling you by the way props to our producers who found video of you hitting game winners not just over your career because there's hundreds <laughs> but in a Dallas uniform, which I appreciate. Uh, appreciate absolutely. the extra touch there. I do want to switch gears, guys, because we got some very unexpected news this morning coming out of Brooklyn. LaMarcus Aldridge announcing that he is, in fact, stepping away from the game due to health played, dealing with an irregular heartbeat. Later on that night, my rhythm got even worse, which really worried me even more. The next morning, I told the team what was going on. They were great getting me to the hospital, getting me checked out. Though I'm better now, what I felt with my heart that night was still one of the scariest things I have experienced. With that being said, I've made the difficult decision to retire from the NBA. For 15 years, I put basketball first, and now it is time to put my health and my family first. So first of all, we wish him and his family the best. This is obviously the right decision. No basketball game is more important than being there for the rest of his life for his family. But Vince, I mean, when you heard this news, what were your first thoughts and what will you remember about playing against LaMarcus? Well, let me say my first thoughts uh, took me back to, doesn't matter when, uh, my junior year in high school, mm -hmm. it's somewhere in the 90s, I was dealing with an irregular heartbeat situation where I had the scary walk from my high school where the hospital was across the street Oof. and I had to go through the EKG test mm -hmm. um, just to make sure everything was fine. And, uh, you know, the thought of that doc talk doctor saying, hey, you might not be able to play this season. As a young kid, basketball is everything. You're, you're having the, the goal to go to, you know, you want to go to college and you want to play in the NBA. Yeah. So scary. as soon as I heard that, it just it was just a scary moment. But. Uh, I hats off to, to LaMarcus for making that tough decision because there's a lot of guys who would make the decision say, uh, I feel better now. I'm going to keep going. And, and, and for, for him, he said, my family and my health is more important than the game of basketball that I've given everything to. And he should be saluted for that. But him as a player, his body of work in Portland and his body of work in, in San Antonio is, it should never be questioned. And I've had, the luxury, I guess, the pleasure of guarding him, right, there taking you some elbows from him, <laughs> yeah, you know, because when you talk about a player on the left side of that block, uh, you know, you, you're watching tape of just that alone. I mean, you see here, like, you know, you, you, uh, I'm going to take away his left shoulder and he has the ability to go to the right shoulder. And by the way, that was a charge right there, that elbow. And it, it hurt me for a couple of weeks. <laughs> but I tell you, <laughs> I'm going to tell you that. But let me tell you, I mean, he's just a great player. And, you know, when you study film on, on a player, you watch them, what they do around the court. And it's like, that's fine. But LaMarcus Aldridge on the left side of the court in, in the post was one of the toughest things and you had to prepare for that you couldn't prepare for at the same time. Look, seven all-star teams in making seven all-star teams in the West is no joke. 20,000 points. We're rounding up to 20,000 points. He's 49 short. We're rounding up 20,000 points and that jumper that high release point, that was a jump shot where defenses had to scrap whatever their usual game plan was to account for that jump shot. You could not let LaMarcus Aldridge shoot pick and pop twos, even if they were just twos, because he would pick and pop you to death. And on that left block, forget it, that was his office. He was taking you down to his office hours. And in Portland, Greg Oden, Brandon Roy, LaMarcus Aldridge, the first two awful career-ending injuries. LaMarcus Aldridge was the bridge to Damian Lillard. And never forget, 2014 playoffs first round completely destroyed the Houston Rockets from the left block. 2014-15, before Wes Matthews tore his Achilles, that Blazers team with Dame, LA, Batum, Wes, and on and on, that was shaping up to be a potentially really interesting team, a possible contender, and was just a joyous team to watch. And LaMarcus was the bridge from one era to another. Then he goes to San Antonio, and who knows what happens if not for that Golden State dynasty rising up. The Spurs were set to be their biggest challenger. Then the Kawhi and KD situations happened. Just a great, great career. My first reaction today was shock. Like, what? That, right. That's happening? And then... You know, we take these guys for granted and we pick apart their games and this and that. LaMarcus has gotten older over the years. I'm going to miss that turnaround from the left block that nobody, nobody could touch.
Yeah, absolutely. And we know we've seen players with problems like this before. It can lead to something very serious if you push it. So again, congratulations to LaMarcus on an incredible, incredible career. Made his stamp in the league, and we will miss you. All right, guys. Coming up on this show, we are going to talk about the general manacles. Kyrie Irving putting the moves on Matisse Thibault before finishing with the floater. Take a look. Ooh. Just mm. so nasty. Then we go over to New Orleans so where Zion took on all five Knicks defenders for the bucket. So, Zach, taking a look, would you rather have Kyrie's moves or Zion's strength? Zion's strength, Zion's strength translates to regular life much more readily than Kyrie Irving's handles. I could lift up my own car if I needed to change a tire. I could move furniture more easily. It's a no-brainer. Give me Zion's strength. Well, it, you know, it just depends on what you're talking about. If you're talking about basketball-wise, Zion, the, the game today, people are flopping. Zion's strength, you know, you, you're more likely to, to fall into foul trouble. Kyrie's handles, you're moving through life however you want to. You're 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 I mean, you're just scooting you're crossing board scooting by everybody. So I'm going with Kyrie. Kyrie can perform actual wizardry, so I would take that. And Zach, I would think my Gryffindor friend, you would take that too. All right, Miss Laziness, <laughs> watch this defensive possession by Utah Watanabe. <laughs> Vince, does this make you tired just looking at it? Man, go guard everybody, young fella. Yeah, we know what's happened before, so this is, he's like, hey, let me take care of this. I'm going to make up for it by defending everyone. And golly, like, that's in the way. I mean, you, you applaud that effort. You know, that's a high motor because not a lot of guys can, you know, after 10, 12 seconds, they're, they're giving up. He did not. He's fighting for his life in the NBA, and low-key, <laughs> Yuta Wananabe has some of the best closeouts in the NBA. It's a nerdy thing to notice, but he is so good at it day in and day out, it's ridiculous. So, so fun. All right, make throwbacks, friends. Okay, so Vince, the other day, Kendrick Perkins said that this Miles Bridges dunk, which, you know, this is the dunk of the year Ooh. so far, it reminded him of your dunk on Alonzo Morning, of all the dunks. That's the one he picked out. What do you think? Uh, I don't like to compare. Mm -hmm. uh, i leave that for everyone else. But he, he definitely, you know, I've had conversations with him about dunk. Oh, there it is. Let me see. Let me see. Yeah, very similar. Very similar. <laughs> you know, and uh, you know, but I, I tell you what, what he's done in the league, he is going through, you know, through big men, through guard, through everybody. Where, you know, when he when he takes off, people are parting ways, and I'm like I'm not, I'm not the one that's going to be in the way of this. And he's he's earned it, and he definitely deserves to be talked about. Look at oh, that. Like we put Vince on the wall of dunks. Vince, we're recreating oh, dunk posters from the 90s, right? Ooh. I, I want to start printing these out and sending them to guys because these posters Man. are excellent. That's awesome. Yeah. All right, make crazy legs. Joe LM. Be careful. Yeah, and I'm going to say it. He, you know, he's in the MVP race, and you don't want to see him go down because he's playing great basketball. And when I see him fall, you know who I think, who I think of? I think of Dwayne Wade when he was falling yes. so much. And he's just like, wow. And look at Dwayne Wade. You heard him say at the end of his career, he said, from falling so much, my body started to hurt. Yeah. And, you know, he was doing it, getting, you know, trying to draw fouls and get the end ones, and I get it. And But you know, it's something for jo Joel to be aware of. I will say that style of play, though, got them the 2006 championship, got Absolutely. him finals Absolutely. MVP. Absolutely. It's called a sacrifice. And got him a good commercial. What is it? Fall down eight times, get up nine, or fall down get seven times, get up eight? That was pretty yeah. pretty good. Fall seven, seven get up eight, says our producer, Steve and Zach. They know. All right, guys, I want to transition to a more serious topic, a story from our Baxter Homes about some front office concerns in regards to this season's schedule. According to Baxter, several NBA general managers, team health officials say the unorthodox and compressed schedule attempting to make up games postponed due to COVID-related issues has led to a rash of injuries around the league, with several teams featuring fearing that player health has reached a boiling point. According to Elias Sports, if you look at this year's All-Stars, they have missed 15% of games this season. That is on pace to be the second highest rate in NBA history. And here is what a couple of anonymous GMs said in the story. Playing every other day for six weeks is a problem. The first GM said, we have defaulted into survival mode. That was a second GM saying that. So, Zach, look, the league office has pushed back on this. They have pointed out that overall injuries, while the all-star injuries may be up slightly, that the overall injuries are actually down from last year. What, what is your feel on this? 
I think you got to stretch pretty far to see any kind of coherent trend here. The numbers don't show any kind of coherent trend that injuries are up or down or whatever. They just are. And sometimes random stuff happens. And I don't think it's a coincidence that this is coming out after Jamal Murray tragically tears his ACL. And then everyone hates that and is miserable about it. But I don't see any real trend here. I will say this, though. The quote about survival mode is instructive because I think one of the reasons maybe that we don't see an increase in injuries is because playing every other day is a problem. The players and coaches are already fatigued from the testing regimen. It screws up their sleep schedule and everything like that. And so I think you're seeing teams hold out guys on back-to-backs, minimize the amount of games that people are playing five and seven or whatever. And maybe that is one reason that there might not be an increase in injuries. And if that's the case, yeah, but clearly this schedule is too much. Nobody wants to play this schedule. And it might be that teams have no choice but to protect themselves and their players from what might be an, inju- an increase in injuries if they actually just played every game. Yeah, I think you're, you're spot on, and, and I feel the same way. I mean, I look at the Hawks who I follow um, uh, on a regular, and they had – what, a two-week, eight-game schedule. That's insane. Mm-hmm. That's insane. And you're starting to see now stars sit out for a, a, a frequent amount of time, like uh, LeBron, like AD, like KD. And you're going to start – I feel like you're going to start seeing uh, other players do the same because they want to have their guys healthy when it counts. Money time is near the end of the season, rolling into playoffs, where you want to hit your stride. And at the end of the day, you have a shortened – uh, season with your, your schedule, uh, uh, what, 10 games. So now what's important? The middle of the season? Yes, you want to you, you want to put yourself in position to be in the right spot for the playoffs because some teams don't just have bad matchups. You don't want to play that. But you don't want to sacrifice that with, by losing some of your best players. And, you know, teams like the Lakers, they say, we feel like we can beat anybody if we're healthy. So that tells me health is more important and I, and I think you're going to start seeing teams do that and you know the the question was oh, who's the guy out with the knee um I'm just drawing the blank uh right now but well, you know I, I think or? uh just yeah a couple of mm-hmm. the, the, uh the, uh, Giannis I'm sorry excuse yeah. me Giannis you know they're worried about Giannis and uh, about him I, I think they're just being safe yeah I being mean- safe because at the end of the day they're going to need Giannis to carry a heavy load and play MVP basketball so why risk it now Yeah, and we'll talk about that a little bit more. And I do think you're right. Mm -hmm. That's why Kevin Durant sat out for so long with the hamstring. That is why LeBron, Anthony Davis, the Lakers are being extra careful because this is not the time you need them most. The playoffs are the time you need them most. I do think, Zach, what you mentioned about the testing is really a key factor here. These guys have to wake up at God knows what hour in the morning. Sometimes it's like 5 or 6 in the morning after getting in from a road trip from another city at two in the morning. So I know, oh, poor baby has to wake up at six. Well, when you haven't gotten to sleep until 2.30 or three because of your work schedule, that then becomes an issue. And the more tired you are, Vince, you know this from being around the league for so long. It builds, it builds, it, builds, it catches up to you. And it makes yeah. you more vulnerable to injury. And I will say the league has tried. Look, you deal with COVID the best you can. And the league has done, I think, really an excellent job from start to finish about dealing with this problem and this incredibly serious virus. But they have told teams at this point, vaccines are now available in this country. The president of the United States made sure that by this week, vaccines are available to everyone. And they have told teams, if 85% of your players and staff get vaccinated, You don't have to test on this schedule anymore. So I am curious if in all of this discussion of injuries and rest, more teams push to see if they can get up to that 85% rate. All right, guys, coming up, Kevin Durant said, oh, I don't know, who was it? It was Vince Carter. Is there any Vince Carter in your game? What about your game do you feel you took from Vince? No, probably the passion that he plays with. Um, He's a unique player. I can't, you can't replicate that, but. The passion that's, that stood out to me when I watched him after he dunked, after he made a big shot and how much he loved to play, you know, you could tell he was excited. That just made me go out there and be more free as a player when I was a kid. Cause I'm just like, if he expressing himself like that, I think I can too, you know? So I think I took that from Vince, you know, obviously his highlights and his athleticism stood out, but like his passion for the game is something that I really appreciated. I just want to point out, Vince Carter, I did not bring up your name in terms of just out of the air. He has long said that you were his favorite player growing up. He loved watching you. What is your reaction to hearing exactly why and how? Uh, I mean, golly, I mean, it's an honor. Like I said, I've I've, I've watched Kevin obviously going against him and everything and just 
just think back into back to his career. Well, first of all, I'll say I once heard the whispers. Yeah, he got me right there on the crossover. <laughs> Ooh, caught me right there. Caught me slipping. But no, I mean, and, and he hit the game winner after I hit that shot. I, I mean, I remember all of these. But let me tell you, uh, I heard whispers and I was like, OK, you know, he's a he's a fan. Oh, I'm his favorite player. Thing. OK, cool. Yeah. Yeah. You know, but people say that. And then to, to actually hear from the horse's mouth, this is I mean, it's unbelievable. And getting the opportunity to play play against him, watching him as a rookie, and remember hearing how they said, could he survive in the league because he wasn't strong enough and so on and so <laughs> forth to watch him grow into the best score in the game's history. I mean, offensively, what can he not do? I mean, he could do it all. He, you know, at one point it was like, oh, he can, he can only go left in the hesitation and in scouting. That's what he, you, know, you guard him on. And now he can go right. He can go whatever he wants. He'll pull up. He can shoot. He can do it all. So it's just been great to see him mature, grow. And, and become a champion and do it his way. Absolutely. Well, it's an honor in both directions, Vince. Let's yes. talk a little MVP, friends. Nikola Jokic, the clear front runner for MVP, according to an ESPN straw poll of NBA media members. Our own Tim Bontemps has been doing this for years. He has a whole system. He polls people who are voters. He polls people from different markets. He uses the same point system that the NBA uses. Embiid here in second, Giannis in third, Dame in fourth, Harden in fifth. Zach, where is your head as a voter? Do you think the MVP is the Jokers to lose at this point? I, I do. I think given all the games that all the other candidates have missed and are missing and, and how outstanding Jokic has been, the, the award is exclusive. The wild card is, what happens if Denver without Jamal Murray, now they won last night by a lot, what happens if they fall to fifth in the West? And I think some voters will look at that and say, well, fifth? Fifth is, is pretty low for an MVP. I mean, Russ won around that range with his team around that range, so it's possible. And the Sixers, well, well they're first. That line doesn't hold a lot of water with me because record-wise, there's only a couple games separating Philly and Denver. Their point differential is about the same. And you know a team that plays in the West is playing a much tougher schedule than a team that plays in the East. But I do think if they were to fall to fifth and Philly stays in first, I think some voters will look a little sideways at that. But to me, yeah, right now we're heading toward a pretty clear Jokic win. Well said. I, I, I agree. I, th I think it's his, it's his to lose, and he's done a great job of getting his body in shape and transforming his body into the player that he's become. I mean, playing every game, not missing a game, producing a, a walking triple-double at the, the big man position. Uh, I mean, can do it all. You know, pass. Any pass you need, you want in the game, he can do. Uh, but he had a supporting cast, and he had Jamal Murray to, to fall on when he maybe had a slow first half or so on. And he has some great guys, some great players. Adding Aaron Gordon is 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 great, and it helps their team, and it will help him. But it's not Jamal Murray. And they're still building, building chemistry, he and Gordon, that is. But I, I think I, I'm interested to see how things work out for him as we move on into the final parts of the season because a lot is going to be asked of him to do, and he's going to probably play more minutes. The ball is going to come through him, as we know, to score a little more. And I'm just curious to see, and I hope he stays uh, healthy, of course, but I'm, I'll be interested to see if he can hold on. Well, this year more than ever, I just think it's a little dangerous to make pronouncements at any point through the season. There was a point where it looked like LeBron would be unstoppable, but then he got hurt. There was a point where Embiid looked like he would be unstoppable. He got hurt. Then he came back. How is it going to influence how he plays through the next few weeks? And I looked up, Embiid has missed 18 of Philadelphia's 54 games. But once that number grows to 72, is that 18 going to seem smaller? Nikola Jokic, on the other hand, so far has played every single one of Denver's games, but... We don't know what's going to happen in the last quarter of the season. I do think the standings thing, Zach, is going to come into play for some voters. I also think this year you might have some voters struggle a little bit with just the label of these are, quote, historic numbers. And that's true for Nikola Jokic. It's cr true in some cases with the Embiid question, career numbers, things like that. What does that even mean this season? We have seen such a bloated rise in scoring. You have to take all of that with a grain of salt. I personally loved watching Joel last night. I think the fact that Philadelphia is in number one matters, but we're just going to have to wait to see the rest of the season. And if Nikola Jokic can do this without Jamal Murray, that is going to matter too. All right, coming up, guys, the presumption.